Our next speaker is Megan Dupuy. She's a speech language pathologist. She's in private practice in San Mateo, and I highly encourage anyone in San Mateo area, San Mateo County, Northern Santa Clara County, to check her out. Uh, she's one of the finest speech language pathologists I have ever met. When I first met her, I don't know, seven or so years ago, I said, oh, I run this support group, people dealing with PSP and CBD. And she actually knew CBD. I was so shocked to find a speech therapist familiar with CBD. It's such a rare disorder. So I'm sure you'll find her talk today about what are the things we can do about communication and swallowing problems in PSP and CBD. Robin's too sweet. Um, yes, I met Robin before I had my three children, and she has had many cancellations of my talks due to me having children. The last talk that I gave for this group, I had delivered, sorry, I had actually delivered a week before, so I feel much better this time. My youngest is three. Um, so anyway, as Robin well knows, I've given a lot of these talks, I did, I was compliant and prepared the PowerPoint, and I heard that everybody has um, access to that PowerPoint, but I'm gonna go off of the PowerPoint for much of my talk, because as a clinician, I want you to really see and feel and understand, you know, the things that I am, that I'm concerned with and speaking of. So, um, you know, why? why? Why do you need a speech therapist? Well, three reasons, swallowing, speech, and language. Um, Dr. Shaw did a great job with the language piece, which I'm, I'm you know, very grateful for because I didn't put any of that in my presentation. The reason I was familiar um, with this population is I did my thesis in college on primary progressive aphasia with Marcel Meslem, who's in, at Northwestern. So that's why I was familiar with this. Um, today, I'm gonna focus mainly on swallowing because I think that if you were to rank you know, why you need to go see a speech therapist, I would put swallowing here um, and maybe speech and voice down here. Now, speech and voice are very important, obviously, for communication with loved ones, communication in general, but swallowing is vital for your overall health, and so I wanna talk about that today. Um, I guess before we talk about that, I just wanna say, if you are gonna go see a speech therapist for your swallowing speech or voice, please do some research and make sure that they have a background because as Robin said, there's not many speech therapists, especially in this Northern California area, that have a background in PSP, CBD, Parkinson's in general. So um, I, would, I would do research and find out who your speech therapist is, what their background is, and if they have worked in that with that population before. So here we go, swallowing. I'm gonna, here I'll stay next to the microphone. If I use my hands up here, can everybody see me? Okay, so why is swallowing so important? Swallowing is so important because in atypical forms of Parkinson's, Parkinson's swallowing will most likely be affected at some point. The rigidity of the muscles, in coordination of muscles, the slowness of movement will cause an increased risk for penetration and aspiration, food and liquid going into or close to the airway. Now, I'll give you a real simple anatomy lesson here. So when you swallow, you put the food in, the food goes to the back, you chew it, goes to the back of your mouth. When you swallow that food, it will go one of two directions. It'll go either into the esophagus, which is this direction, or it will go into the airway, which is this direction. And there's not much to separate those two things. What separates them is what's called your epiglottis, and whoever has gone to see a speech therapist has probably heard this before. Your epiglottis moves up and down to protect one of the protections of the airway. If you go towards the airway tract on that side, then you'll hit your vocal cords, which is another protective mechanism. It's another um, you know, 
obstacle that that food or liquid has to get past. And so many times, not only will there be weakness in coordination in the muscles that control the larynx, pharynx, the muscles that move the food down, that control that epiglottic movement, but also the um, vocal cords, the muscles that control the vocal cords. So let's say, you know, it gets past the first gate here of the epiglottis, the, the liquid gets down there. If you're having any difficulty with the muscles that control the vocal cords and the vocal cords are sitting open, the food or liquid can go into the airway, which is called aspiration. Now, one of the biggest risks with Parkinson's or atypical Parkinson's, either one, is that many of my clients have, have a very um, decreased sensation of the pharynx larynx area. So they may have food or liquid that goes down and gets stuck in this area, but they don't know. They ha there's no signs. There's no coughing. There's no throat clearing. There's no drooling. There's no watery eyes, all the classic signs you may have heard before. There's really no evidence. And so how would you know if you have swal a swallowing disorder? Or how would you know if you had aspiration? Well, a lot of times I don't see a patient until after they've been diagnosed with an aspiration pneumonia and they have had maybe sometimes chronic aspiration pneumonias. So I always tell people at these conferences, prevention is the easiest treatment. If you go and see a speech ther therapist before you even consider you may have some difficulty swallowing, it's much easier to find treatment, to, to um, find exercises that help, may help increase the strength, mobility, coordination of those muscles that you need for swallowing before an aspiration pneumonia occurs. So I would encourage everybody um, to go see a speech therapist very early on so that you never have to be in the hospital for an aspiration pneumonia. Now, um, there are some slight differences with PSP, um, CBD. I think the biggest with CBD is the that it's unilateral. So there are, sometimes there's some strategies that a speech therapist can give um, a client. For example, if food or liquid is swallowed and there's a unilateral weakness, we sometimes say turn your head to the weak side or tuck your chin to the weak side to close off the airway on that side so food or liquid doesn't go down to the airway on that side. Um, that's just one example. Um, with the PSP, honestly, although it's not anatomical, um, meaning when I look at a modified barium swallow or, or a fees, which we'll talk about in a minute, I don't, you know, it's not something you see, but the lack of motivation, the apathy that comes along with that is often um, something that can be difficult when having, when asking somebody to always imply strategy or to do their exercises for swallowing. Um, so we're going to move forward just a little bit here because I know I'm going to run out of time. So you may ask, you know, what, how, how are you diagnosed? What, what is the process? Well, you'd go see a speech therapist, and they would probably do an in-office evaluation for swallowing. And then they might recommend that you do one of two things. You have a modified barium swallow, or that you have what's called fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. And so the difference between the two, as you see here, is one is basically an x-ray of your swallow where you'll see food and liquid going down um, from a lateral view. And the other one is looking with a little, a little camera down into your vocal cord, at your vocal cords, your larynx and pharynx. So it really depends on what the symptoms are, what your therapist might recommend as an objective measure. But what I would highly recommend is that everybody um, push for that objective measure because a minute ago I said, you know, most of the time clients with atypical or typical Parkinson's have a lot of decreased sensation here. You may not know if you're aspirating or penetrating. Um, this, these type of evaluations, the objective evaluations, 
will be the identifying marker for the aspiration. So we'll be able to see, number one, did somebody aspirate or penetrate on these evaluations? But more importantly, sometimes we'll be able to f figure out what we can do to prevent the aspiration or penetration. We might try different um, textures of foods, different liquids, different strategies like the head turn or chin tuck that I mentioned. Um, to see what we can do to prevent an aspiration or penetration from occurring. Now, it's not always, um, you know, we're not always able to prevent aspiration or penetration. Um, if we aren't able to prevent it, you know, there, there's obviously um, other measures that might have to take place, such as recommendation for feeding tube. However, I would say in the majority of cases that I've worked with, I wouldn't recommend that until it is the only resort because there are a lot of complications that can occur as a result of that. Um, now, I could talk about swallowing speech and language each for an entire day, so I'm going to move really quickly. But um, I want you to just take away that swallowing disorders are not obvious in this atypical Parkinson's group. So. I might have a client walk into my office, they might eat a graham cracker, they might eat a piece of chocolate cake, they might swig, you know, some water, look just fine, and then I might say to them, you know what, we're gonna, I want, really want to do a modified barium swell. I'll even call it a neurologist many times and the neurologist will say, I don't think so, I don't, I don't think we need to do a modified barium swell, there's no signs or symptoms of aspiration pneumonia. I always push to have that objective uh, measure with this population because more often than not what I'll find is that the penetration or aspiration is silent and that we do see some evidence of at least penetration early on into the airway and there again are ways to prevent that aspirate, aspiration pneumonia from occurring. So I'm going to talk just briefly now about the speech challenges. Um, so as you've heard um, Dr. Shaw mentioned to the hypokinetic dysarthria and the spastic dysarthria. Um, the hallmark of a hypokinetic dysarthria is really a quiet voice or a quick pace. I have a client I'm working with right now who, um, you know, when he comes in, he'll sound very much like this. Hello, but that and I and and so he has both in a, a form of aphasia and he has difficulty with production of um, words and sequencing sounds. Um, a lot of times, too, due to incoordination of breath from the diaphragm. So that is one, um, one thing that I'll often, and, and there are many treatment strategies that I work on with these clients. So um, we start always with breath. So. We want to make sure that someone, as silly as it sounds, is taking a breath from the diaphragm before you go to say something. A lot of times what I'll see is that there's this incoordination of breath to voice. And so someone will go to speak, but they haven't breathed. There's no breath before they go to speak. So when they go to speak, they, you know, there's this... <gasps> You know, I, I don't have any, I don't have any breath to support it. So that's one form. The other form of dysarthria is really that spastic dysarthria, and that's where you might hear these loud bursts and strained voice quality. So it'll be, you know, talk like this, and then that's, um, there are also strategies we can work on with those clients to help reduce that spastic um, dysarthria quality to their voice. Um, now, as you all know, we're not able to reverse many times the either voice, speech, or swallowing. Um, but what I'd like for you to take away is we are often able to maintain the strength, coordination, flexibility of the lips, tongue, jaw, larynx, pharynx, muscles um, much longer than 
if someone had not come in to do exercises. So the maintenance, I would say, is really the goal of a speech therapist when somebody has entered treatment. Um, you want to maintain everything that you have so as long as you can. Um, so that I'd say that would be the most important goal. And prevention, of course, uh, the, the swallowing. I'm not going to go into LSVT treatment because that's a whole lecture in itself and if someone would like to ask when I'm on the panel about it, we can. But what I would like to do instead is do some of the exercises that I would do with clients so that you really understand each one. Okay, so let's say, for example, you came in for a swallowing evaluation. One of the first things I might do is feel your larynx and pharynx. So I want everybody to put two fingers right here on your larynx, okay? What I want you to do is swallow. Swallow your saliva. What do you feel? You should feel your larynx move up and forward and back down. It goes up, forward, down, just like that. Many times what I feel is even without any food or liquid trials, I'll feel a severe reduction of that larynx moving up, forward, back, and down. Um, that's going to be the first indication that there's something going on there. Then I might ask somebody, believe it or not, to sing for me. So I'll have them say, you know, I'll say, can you sing scale upwards? Ah. So if you try that, see what happens. Everyone try it. All right, so your larynx should move up. I tell people it's like, you know, pushing that larynx up with those muscles. Your larynx is moving up and then going down. Aww. Should feel that voice box move down. So that's another way you can check and see the movement of the vocal cord and, and the larynx going up and down. And you can also listen to voice while doing that. Um, you can listen for breast support while doing that. And then what I'll do is I'll give um, clients trials of food or liquid and I'll look for any signs or symptoms. You know, the classic um, coughing, throat clearing, watery eyes, um, choking, of course, difficulty with breathing. If I see any of those, of course, you know, we'll recommend treatment. If I don't see any of those, what will I do? <laughs> also recommend modified barium swallow or fees um, just to rule out that silent aspiration. Now, going on to the, the speech piece of it. As Dr. Shaw already, uh, she talked a little bit about this. There's apraxia, so what is that? It's a sound sequencing disorder. So often what I'll do is I'll look at sound sequences in order. So for example, bilabial sounds. I'll have everyone do it with me. Pa 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 pa. Pa ba 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 ba. Ma 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 ma. Okay, move back to the medial sounds. Ta 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 ta. Da 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 da. And then back to the back sounds. Ka ka ka. Ga ga ga. Okay, so I'll listen for each one and I'll watch somebody's lips. You know, are they able to put their lips together for that good strong lip movement for the bilabial sounds, pa, ba, ma, the T, listening for the tongue tip hitting the roof of mouth, ta, da, is it get, getting up there, can it reach the top of the roof of the mouth, can I hear the base of tongue hitting the soft palate, that ka, ga, ka, ga, that hard transition, and then I want to listen for sequences, so I'll often start with two sequences, one will be ta, ga, ta, ga, you know, we'll go from medial to back, so everybody try it and think about where's your tongue hitting hard palate and then back. Tugga, tugga, tugga. And then I'll have people do three sequences. And this is a rapid, I, I do much more than this during the evaluation, but a rapid sequence would be patika, 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 or malega, 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 or you go backwards. You know, gadaba, 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 gadaba. <laughs> Or you start in the middle, tagaba, 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 tagaba. And I listen, is someone able to sequence their tongue from front, middle, back, front, middle, back? It doesn't have to be a real word. It just has to be sequencing. And so if I hear that somebody isn't able to sequence, that's a good indication that they are apraxic. So that sounds sequencing disorder. And then, of course, the primary progressive aphasia. I will listen for the fluency of their speech. Are they dropping the grammatical markers? Again, as the doctor already um, explained, you know, is, is it just verbs and nouns that I'm hearing? Or do I hear those articles, prepositions that make um, 
speech nice and fluent. The other thing that I listen for is prosody. So listening for that intonation in your voice. For example, if I, if I am asking a question, I'll say, where are you going? It goes up at the end, right? But a lot of times, clients with atypical Parkinson's will have this very monotone voice quality. So they'll often omit those um, intonation patterns up and down. So you'll hear, where is he going? What is he doing? Instead of, you know, where is he going? An up intonation or a falling intonation where you might say, he's going home. I don't know. Um, and so often I'll give a client a phrase, the White House, okay? Can you change the stress on each word? The White House, the White House, the White House. Can you do that independently? Can you do it in longer phrases? Can you go up, can you make it a question, the White House? Can you be upset about it, the White House? You know, I'll listen for those intonational patterns. Um, so there are a lot of reasons <laughs> to go see a speech therapist. Um, and so I, I would say, again, the most important is for the, the swallowing. Oh, the last thing I, I wanted to do before, we, before I end is I wanted you to think about some of the exercises, too, that I would give a client. So for example, if I were to say, um, I want you to work on lip strength, tongue strength, laryngeal strength. I might do something like this and I'll have everybody participate because I know it's that after lunch dark in here. I'm going to wake up a little bit. Okay, so we're going to do it together. Are you ready? Okay, stick your tongue straight out at me, up toward your nose, down toward your chin, back and forth. Good. Push on the side of your, on your cheek. Knock, knock. Other time. Okay, around in a circle. Okay, we need that for sweeping the oral cavity for food and liquid. If it gets stuck in there, it's going to be an aspiration <laughs> risk, right? Okay, push the t tongue tip to the roof of the mouth as hard as you can. You sh it should feel like it's going to fall off after. If, you do if it doesn't, you're not doing it hard enough. Mm. Good. And I want to see, is there any muscle? You know, if, am I seeing any muscle de definition here? I'll often say to, to clients, we're going to do some work with cheeks, lips, jaw. So I'll say, smile really big. Let me see. Can you do it each side independently? So this is where I might see some unilateral weakness with the CBD. So one side, other side. One side, other side. Or blow up the cheek on one side, other side. Back and forth. So is there coordination? Is there strength? Um, are you able to to get the lip closure that you need for eating, for speaking, all of that. Um, that's just, you know, just a teaser about, you know, some of the exercises you might do. Um, but there are a lot of exercises that you might do to help strengthen the tongue, lips, jaw, larynx. There's something called the Mendelssohn Maneuver. For example, you pull that larynx up, so you're going to swallow halfway. So think, I'm going to swallow halfway, hold the larynx up at the height of the swallow, hold for two seconds, one, two, allow the larynx to drop back down. So you're going to go, hold, hold, drop the larynx back down. What you're doing is I tell people, you know, when you do leg squats and you're trying to increase the strength of, of the thighs, you're trying to isolate those muscles, right? Same thing with your larynx. You're trying to isolate those muscles in the larynx at the height of the swallow to help strengthen the larynx so that you can maintain that strength and coordination for swallowing. All right, so I know I'm giving my five minutes. Again, I could, I could speak about each one of these things for an entire day, and I tried to make it as quick as possible, and I'll be happy to answer any questions afterwards um, that are specific, but those are just some reasons to come see a speech therapist. Again, I would encourage everybody to go see a speech therapist at some point to make sure that your swallowing is safe and you're able to maintain the strength as long as possible. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.